Okay, so a very warm welcome to all our participants and of course in particular to our uh, two speakers. Um, this is uh, the fifth installment in a webinar series hosted by the Nordic Committee on Bioethics, which was founded in, founded in 1989 to promote Nordic cooperation and exchange of information in the field of bioethics with special, special reference to issues in life science, biotechnology, medicine, governance society. Uh, and of course, this uh, current pandemic is the, the perfect storm to, uh, to um, uh, consider all of these uh, issues and perhaps uh, also to bring out a, a Nordic perspective. Uh, this uh, webinar series is uh, recorded. Um, if you have any questions, um, please use the Q&A uh, function in uh, Zoom, and then uh, I will read out your question uh, later on uh, to our participants. I think we will take both um, speakers one after the other, and then we have time at the end if you have any questions. Uh, and afterwards, you will be able to find this uh, webinar on uh, the Nordic Committee on Bioethics YouTube channel, where you can also catch uh, the four previous installments in this webinar series. So without further ado, I will pass the floor to you, Katerina uh, Okathra, um, almost associate professor at the University of Copenhagen and also the principal investigator of a project funded by the Independent Research Fund Denmark on exactly these issues. Thank you so much, Katerina. Thanks, Jana. Yes, um, I will just put up my slides, which I'm assuming you can see. Okay. Um, yeah, so first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to present today. Um, and we're looking forward to it. So the title of my presentation is uh, COVID-19, a health and human rights perspective. And as Jana mentioned, I am based at the Faculty of Law of the University of Copenhagen. I have a couple of aims today with my talk and I'll, they're just outlined in this slide. So the primary aim is really to zero in on the health and human rights perspective and focus on issues like stigma and discrimination, trust versus coercion, criminal law as a tool of public health, and to bring proportionality, in particular, less restrictive measures and sci scientific evidence in to focus. So just to start off and say, well, what is actually a health and human rights perspective? And my approach is that it seeks to infuse human rights laws, uh, human rights in health laws and policies. It acknowledges health as a human right, thereby elevating the balancing of health from an issue of rights to interests. It opposes discrimination or stigma as a public health strategy. And I will come back to these different points throughout the presentation today. But just to start out, I just want to highlight that states do have obligations under, for example, the right to health in connection with COVID-19. These obligations stem from, for example, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, whereby under Article 8, states are obligated to take steps to achieve the full realization of the right to health, including through the prevention, treatment and control of epidemic, endemic, occupational and other diseases, and the creation of conditions which would assure to all medical service and medical attention in the event of sickness. Also under the European Social Charter, which is a Council of Europe treaty, states must prevent as far as possible epidemic and other diseases. Naturally, these obligations are, for, are for, uh, a phrase quite broadly, um, and the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, General Comment Number 14, is very influential in this area in framing what these obligations um, consist of. So the committee has stated that this requires that states ensure sufficient health personnel, access to health facilities without discrimination, and affordable health care that is respectful and of good quality. So it's clear that states have an obligation to act 
in relation to the pandemic. Um, and I would also suggest that this should be viewed in light of the World Health Organization's International Health Regulations, which is also an international by, internationally binding treaty, where under states are obligated to prevent, protect against, control, and provide a public health response to infectious diseases of international concern with full respect for the dignity, human rights, and fundamental freedoms of persons. So there is an overlap there, which I think should also be given um, increased focus. So this is just briefly to say that I recognize that states have obligations in relation to COVID-19 and everything I say after that should be um, interpreted in that light. But regardless of states having these obligations or even though states have these obligations, um, there's one issue I'd like to start with, and that is the issue of stigma and discrimination in public health law. So in public health literature, there's a question of whether stigma can and should be a tool to discourage harmful health behavior, like smoking, and encourage positive health behavior, like healthy eating. And with the COVID pandemic, social context has really become a focal point as this is how the disease spreads, we all know. And family, friends acquaint and acquaintances have taken a perhaps unprecedented interest in who you meet, how many people you meet, where you're meeting. And I recognize that this newfound interpersonal fascination is an understandable byproduct of our collective boredom. However, from a health and human rights perspective, this can be problematic as it leads the society to myopically focus on individual behavior. For example, did you get a test? Were you careful? As opposed to underlying structures, such as poverty and insecure working conditions, which all have a very important role to play in the transmission of COVID-19. And there's a risk that this will spill over to legal decisions regarding, for example, compensation for COVID-related injuries. For example, will bodies scrutinize? Did the person take adequate measures to avoid the injury? Do they have a so-called risky personal life where they could have contracted the virus instead? And this, this sti potentially stigmatizing perspective is, is well known or well seen in the media. And it has led to a focus on certain groups who are perceived to have risky behavior, such as young people. And in these examples of headlines, it's important to note that these in normal times are perfectly, what could be described as perfectly innocent behaviors, um, meeting outdoors, watching birds in one case. And, and really my point here is that um, I would argue we need to move from this stigmatizing or potentially stigmatizing approach and instead to focus on an approach that actually builds trust. And while these, while these uh, examples might appear a bit flippant, we can actually see how, um, where they can go potentially. So here in Denmark, um, there, has been a, there has been a higher representation of what are, what are called non-Western immigrants um, in COVID figures. So higher rates of COVID infections among certain ethnic or national groups. And there's recently been a, um, a report which was basically in uh, focus groups with people representing or part of these communities to try and um, to try and gather experiences. And one of the participants came with this quote, which I've also translated to English, which I think really underlines some of the risks here. And he says, do not shame anyone, do not point the finger. Let's find a way together in this. Viruses do not know ethnicity. We are each other's friends, not enemies. Let's defeat this virus. Because stigma can lead to discrimination. And in Denmark, for example, Somalians um, or persons of Somali descent are overrepresented in the COVID cases. And as a result, there have very unfortunately been reports of um, people being threatened or experiencing verbal abuse, such as ethnic Danes not wanting to use Somali taxi drivers for fear of contracting the virus. Um, and I think all this has to be viewed in the context of a country that has identified certain areas as ghettos, this is the government's wording, not mine, um, because of the number of non-Western immigrants who live there. And actually in one of these areas, Bosmosa, the government 
actually proposed a bill to require the forced testing of residents, although it was not actually passed by the parliament in the end. So my last point on this issue is just to say that this all goes against the lessons of the HIV AIDS pandemic. And governments and policymakers initially responded to HIV in problematic manners, such as using criminal law to criminalize unintentional transmission. And the conclusion from many years was that stigma drives people underground and it leads them to avoid testing out of fear of social and legal consequences. And for this reason, UNAIDS has released a number of policy recommendations where it tries to remind um, politicians and governments of the lessons that should have been learned from that pandemic. And some of the recommendations are to engage infected communities, to avoid stigma and discrimination, and to remove uh, barriers to empowerment. So just to finish off on that point, I think following the human rights approach, it is very important to look at the underlying structures that are um, increasing or encouraging transmission, not merely to look at individual behaviours in a vacuum. So my second point um, relates to the issue of uh, less restrictive measures and scientific evidence as part um, of the proportionality assessment. So we're all aware that most human rights are not absolute and they can be limited provided a number of criteria are fulfilled. And the Human Rights Committee has provided some guidance as to how states are to conduct this exercise in its general comments. So it is stated that the limitations must be appropriate to achieve their protective function. They must be the least intrusive instrument among those which might achieve the desired result, and they must be proportionate to the interest to be protected. They've also stated that limitations includes a value assessment, weighing the nature and detrimental impacts of the interference on the exercise of the right against the resultant benefit to one of the grounds for interfering. If the detriment outweighs the benefit, the restriction is disproportionate and thus not permissible. The conditions um, specified here actually echo the WHO's treaty, the International Health Regulations, which I mentioned earlier, which underscore that public health measures shall not be more restrictive of international traffic and not more invasive or intrusive to persons than reasonably available alternatives that would achieve the appropriate level of health protection. And the regulations go on to state that in, term, in determining whether to implement restrictions, states should have regard to scientific principles, scientific evidence, and specific guidance and advice from the WHO. However, in previous pandemics, we have seen that states revert to restrictive measures provoked by fear. So for example, during the West African Ebola outbreak, some states banned entry, entry from African countries that only had one case, for example. And of course, in this pandemic, we have all witnessed how previously perfectly legal and normal con conduct can become illegal and sometimes actually criminalized. Things that are central to life, such as exercise, contact with others, have been prohibited. And this includes, for example, in some jurisdictions, outdoor exercise, which as we all should know by now, is central to our health. For example, in Spain, children were prohibited from going outdoors for six weeks last year, while people could go outside to walk their dogs. For people living in houses with gardens, perhaps this can be tolerated, but for those in cities without access to the outside, it leads me to ask whether less restrictive measures were seriously considered and whether this measure follows scientific evidence, in particular, for example, taking the Spanish example, in a country with high obesity rates. So my point here is just to highlight that when we look at proportionality, some things, or in a broad, um, when we look broadly at proportionality, some things can seem necessary or reasonable from one perspective, but when we consider other perspectives, it can seem disproportionate. So, so some examples I just um, came with here, which are actually real examples of COVID regulations that we gathered in this research project. A single parent family is fined for taking their children to the park. 
an elderly person prohibited from entering a supermarket in rush hour, a child with a disability prohibited from exercising more than once a day, a person living in a built up area that, that may only exercise within two kilometers, a family in a remote area is not permitted to walk outside. And I believe we should ask ourselves if the detriment outweighs the benefits in, for example, these cases. So the last part of my talk looks at the use of criminal sanctions as a public health measure. I should say from the outset here that I take a principled approach, which is that I oppose the use of criminal sanctions as a tool of public health. I do recognize that criminal sanctions can have other aims, but here I'm talking about uh, criminal sanctions that are supposed to produce a specific public health outcome. And in the following, I just want to zero in on some problematic examples of criminal sanctions. So the first relates to here in Copenhagen, um, and many of you may be familiar with the area Christiania. Um, and this is a place where individuals often, until recently, have sold marijuana. Um, with limited interference at one stage at least from the police. However, since January of this year, the police have issued um, consecutive bans, stopping um, which are called Oppelsvobul in Danish and basically which mean that you are not allowed to stop in an area. Um, and it is actually, the Christiania is actually the only place in Denmark currently to be subject to such a ban, whereas other places um, like recreational areas have previously been subject to the ban. And I think the question is here whether the police, um, whether the powers given to the police are being misapplied to target the selling of marijuana instead of COVID prevention, which is actually the aim of that provision. So in that way, there is a risk that we um, misuse the legal basis or that we stretch um, the implementation or the, yeah. So another example also in Denmark is this issue of um, what's called double punishment. So the government passed legislation last year allowing for double punishment. And this means that someone who commits a crime connected to COVID-19 can receive double the punishment that they normally would. So the law was originally conceived in response to reports of individuals stealing hand sanitizers from hospitals at the height of the pandemic. But it's now come into focus recently um, when individuals con in, um, convicted of inciting violence at anti-COVID regulations protests received a high custodial sentence um, based on this provision. And I think it draws into focus, what are these provisions designed to achieve and do they really have anything to do with public health? And returning to the question of stretching the bounds of public health, um, also in that same bill, um, a provision was included um, at a later stage that allows for deporting persons convicted of a COVID crime uh, of a one year sentence. And my concern is that in this manner, pandemic regulations can be used as a, as a means to further political agendas and slip in provisions um, with other aims and also by avoiding actually a political debate because as we know many of these regulations were passed very quickly um, and without much societal uh, consultation which I recognize at the time was necessary but I think there is a risk that when we push provisions or when politicians push provisions like this in it can actually undermine the trust and in the public, in these COVID regulations, and also in politicians. So just to move to another jurisdiction, uh, which we look at in my project, and if you haven't heard from my accent, I am Irish. Um, so in many countries, um, fines have actually been used to promote compliance with COVID regulations. This hasn't been used to the same extent in the Nordic countries, although there are some examples here in Denmark. Um, but in countries like Britain, Ireland and Spain, fines have been used, um, yeah, quite a lot. Um, for instance, in Ireland, as of March, 13,000 fines have been issued for breaches of COVID-19 regulations, 
and the most of the fines relate to people leaving their homes without a reasonable excuse. And organisations working with young people in a number of disadvantaged urban areas are really concerned about the deterioration in relations with the police. Um, and they have said that these policing actions, such as checkpoints and enforcements, are often now interpreted as attempts to control the population rather than efforts to protect against COVID-19. And undermining policing in communities where trust is fragile can be very problematic. We only need to look at Northern Ireland um, where there are serious issues at the moment. Another problem that's been mentioned in this context is there's a lack of disaggregated data, unlike in the UK where the um, ethnicity of people receiving fines has been broken down. But in Ireland, we don't actually know who is receiving the fines um, in terms of ethnicity, but we do know that it's, it is predominantly younger people. And I just wanted to draw your attention to this um, report by the Irish Policing Authority. And in it, they state that the statutory instruments um, that outline the regulations are complex and frequently amended. They are not easy to read. The presentation of their intent can be misunderstood. Just as in the early days of the restrictions when guidance to older people um, was wrongly perceived, but as a legal requirement, there appears to be some persistent misunderstanding of certain restrictions. Um, and this means that people, um, that the people perceive the regulations as more restrictive than they are, and people may be unnecessarily limiting uh, perfectly permissible activities. I think this is interesting that the policing authority is recognizing this, um, but it's hugely problematic if individuals can't foresee the law, are, un are unsure how to act in compliance with the law, and are maybe um, taking certain actions that is actually not required by the law because they are um, in fear of uh, receiving a fine or worse. So just some final points. Um, in relation to going forward. And I suppose these are just reflection questions. I don't have the answer, but things that I've been wondering about are, will the pandemic undermine the substance of human rights? So we've seen derogations and also um, very uh, far reaching limitations. How will courts, including the European Court of Human Rights, interpret the proportionality of the measures adopted? And finally, how will politics um, such as anti-vaxxers or violent protests influence court decisions. So as a sort of a, a little teaser, perhaps, um, I have this example from Denmark to finish with, and um, which I'm wondering um, if it's COVID spreading to other laws. So this bill has recently been proposed by the Danish government, um, and it would uh, amend the police law and would state that for the purposes of promoting what's called security in an area, the police may issue a ban on staying in a specific place to which there is general access. If the behaviour of a group of persons in the area in question creates insecurity for persons living or moving in the area. So this to me um, is very reminiscent of um, what I introduced earlier, the Oppos Forbul, um, so people not being allowed to stay in a specific area to avoid transmission. And this seems to be potentially now being introduced um, into general policing. So the examples in the, in the preparatory works are that um, if young people um, or groups of people are congregating in a certain area and, for example, making a lot of noise or other individuals feel threatened by them, the police would have the power to um, ban people from sitting or staying in that area. To me, that, um, that could result in risks of discrimination or stigmatization and in the risk of certain groups, um, potentially ethnic groups, potentially people who speak a different language than Danish, um, being targeted because they are perhaps too loud. So it's just to say that this could be a sign of how COVID um, will in the long term affect our legislation. So finally, um, I just want to acknowledge that this is a project called Legislating Corona.
um, which is funded by the Independent Research Fund Denmark. Um, and a lot of the ideas I've presented here are forthcoming in a chapter in uh, COVID-19 and human rights, which is forthcoming this year. Um, and some of the issues have also been presented in another paper. And then thanks to my colleagues in the project, as well as our student assistants in Welma. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Katerina. If anyone has uh, questions at this point, maybe you could uh, write it in the Q&A and then we'll come back to your questions uh, once we have heard the commentary from Gro Nystuen, who's the Associate Director of the Norwegian National Human Rights Institution. Thank you so much, Gro, for giving a commentary. We just need you to unmute. Classical start <laughs> of a presentation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for the very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm going to touch upon some of the uh, same points as you have. Um, as a national uh, human rights institution, uh, you can, uh, uh, as, as you can expect, we did spend considerable time and resources on COVID since March 2020. Uh, we've been answering a lot of public hearings on legislation and regulations, uh, most of them with very short deadlines. And uh, we have also commented on the lack of such hearings, um, that the things have been decided without putting it out to the public. We have written letters to ministries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and um, uh, so COVID has really changed uh, um, the, the activity at, uh, at uh, our institution, although we, of course, we also have to do our normal things. Um, our point of departure uh, has always been to acknowledge the state's duty to uh, secure the right to life and the right to health. Um, uh, but uh, we have discussed uh, with this uh, point of departure issues relating to, to human rights and rule of law. And if I were to guess uh, which words that we have used most frequently um, during this past year, it would be proportionality and necessity. Um, as early as 24th April 2020, so almost a year ago, the government established a public commission to look at the way that the authorities have handled the corona situation. And when we looked at this, um, the mandate of this commission, we noted that it was somewhat thin on human rights and rule of law. And so we wrote a letter to the chairman of this commission uh, very soon after it had been established and offered to, to help them with these topics. And this offer was instantly taken up. And the result was the report that we submitted to the Commission in November last year. And uh, we have sent you a link uh, to this report. It's also on our website, but uh, sadly it's in Norwegian, but a lot of you can understand Norwegian. Um, the Commission itself submitted its final report to the government about a week ago. So, so our report was much, much earlier. And um, a lot of the content that we had provided in our report uh, is reflected in the, in the Commission's report. Um, of course, a lot of things have happened since our report in November. Um, and uh, it's a little early to pronounce a final verdict on the government's ha handling of the corona situation. It's not over yet. And the Commission has been tasked with continuing its work, and it's going to, to start working on a second report. So, um, as in many other countries, human rights and rule of law were not always at the forefront when decisions and laws and regulations were being made in the corona crisis in Norway. I will comment on some of the key points, but of course there are many others that, that could be commented on and that you will find many of them in, in our report. Um, the Commission points out, as we did, that there are certain vulnerable groups that were not sufficiently protected. 
um, there were not sufficient assessments of the consequences relating to the closing of schools and kindergartens, for example, and how this would affect children at risk of domestic violence and abuse. Um, this was one key point. Uh, also, we, we looked at uh, the, the right to education for children. Um, we also commented on the fact that many municipalities uh, particularly adopted strict limitations on the right to movement um, at nursery homes and at homes for persons with mental disabilities. Um, and uh, some instances, these um, cases were, were close to deprivation of liberty, if not uh, over the limit. Um, and and uh, decisions were made without the weighing of the medical need versus the rights of these people uh, and also their, these people's family, of course, and friends. So the discussion of proportionality and necessity was often not there. And um, the principle which uh, you, the previous speaker also referred to, the principle of looking for the least restrictive measure was often not respected and not taken into account. And uh, we, for example, wrote a letter in May uh, to uh, the health uh, bureaucrats to alerting them to this situation uh, at a number of, of uh, uh, housing units for people with um, mental disabilities. Um, um, there, there, were, there would be like, you know, the municip municipal uh, head doctor would put a note on the door saying uh, no one can leave or enter this this building <laughs> you know and uh, we got a lot of um, telephones and, and emails from very frustrated um, both employees and uh, and parents um, uh, wondering uh, about this um, we also had um, Another uh, very important point that we thought was one of the most serious points were uh, very restrictive measures that were adopted in prisons. Because all people who were sort of detained or imprisoned would automatically be subjected to a period of 14 days in complete isolation. Uh, and this did not have sufficient legal basis in the Imprisonment Implementation Act. And that, that we thought was a very serious uh, violation. Um, we also had some sort of Norwegian specific uh, cases, which is difficult for you to understand in Denmark, but we had some municipalities in the far north who uh, decided that persons from the southern part of Norway were not allowed to enter their municipalities. Um, and the argument was to hinder the spreading of Corona, which had then not become uh, prevalent in the north at all. And uh, this obviously also had a very doubtful uh, legal basis. Um, the original law proposal from the government, uh, which came in, uh, in mid-March uh, 2020, which was what we called Corona Loven or the, the Corona Law, um, it went quite far in transferring uh, authority from the parliament to the government. And um, this proposal was subject to rather fierce discussions, uh, first among the opposition in parliament, and then it, it, the, the, the group of uh, institutions that were uh, asked to comment uh, became expanded and we sent our comment on it. And in the end, uh, it was improved substantially, uh, in, in, uh, including through an arrangement whereby one third of the parliament was given a sort of a veto power uh, for regulations and laws according to this, uh, this law. Um, I think it's, uh, it must be said that the tradition with sending foundation in the Norwegian democracy, and um, the commission, uh, as we also thought, um, says that it is a weakness, a weakness that the government and the ministries uh, not have been providing uh, or, or made sure that things have been sent on public hearings um, uh, sufficiently uh, to, to a sufficient degree. Uh, we have some other 
specific Norwegian examples, uh, uh, which were one of them uh, was popularly re referred to as the cabin prohibition, uh, and the other one was uh, about launching an app for tracing the spreading of COVID. The, the cabin prohibition or hytteforbude was probably the one single measure that enraged Norwegians the most, and this will probably amuse uh, Nordic listeners here. Um, this, of course, came before the Easter holiday last year, and, uh, and this is a big crisis in Norway where very many people have little cabins in the mountains where they go in the Easter, and they were not allowed to go to these cabins. And, um, uh, and that, was, that was a big issue. And uh, I, th I thought of it when, when you were talking, uh, Katrina, because it did kind of stretch the legal basis a little bit, because the argument was really not so much that people would you know, become affected if they went to their cabins in the mountain. The argument was that the local health services would not be able to deal with a lot of you know, cabin tourists uh, who all of a sudden got the illness. So, um, uh, well, anyway, it was, uh, this ban was lifted shortly after Easter and they did not try to repeat it this Easter. The only court case that we have had so far in Norway uh, relating to Corona is actually about people who have cabins in Sweden and who have not been allowed to go there. So, um, so that's an interesting case, which is, which is going on. The app on um, tracing of uh, COVID uh, turned out not to be consistent with the right to privacy and GDPR uh, rules and had to be withdrawn. And this, uh, this is a good example of how a public hearing would have been a good idea because the, the, um, the app itself was introduced uh, 14 days before, uh, after uh, the regulation was adopted, it, which means that they could have put it out on a hearing and they would have gotten responses which would have then uh, made them able to understand that, you know, this would not uh, actually work. Um, uh, there was another <coughs> instance of um, probably a, a violation, which was the prohibition against leaving the country for health professionals. That was probably a violation of, uh, of uh, a constitutional provision in Norway. Um, but having read a bit about corona measures in other countries, and particularly in your article, uh, I think Norway is not a very bad case comparatively. We also do have fines, by the way, um, uh, particularly for violation of, of quarantine, but also of, uh, of the regulations on um, how many people are allowed to gather in one place. And a famous example, which may have reached uh, the foreign world, I don't know, was that our Prime Minister, Arna Solberg, got a fine for having uh, arranged her 60th birthday at a mountain, of course, a restaurant. And it was actually pronounced as a, an aggravating circumstance that she was Prime Minister. You know, she should have known uh, these rules, which is, uh, which is interesting. Now, she accepted the fine, by the way, it was 20,000 Norwegian kroners. Um, I, I should mention that we did have a proposal uh, for a curfew in, uh, in Norway from the government. Uh, this was to adopt the legal basis for a curfew in the event that it should become necessary at some point. It wasn't said that it was necessary at this point, but you know, just to have the legal basis there would be handy. And this was sent on a public hearing, and there were many hundred respondents. Uh, people were uh, outraged by this as well. Of course, we are very outdoorsy people. And the proposal was uh, eventually dropped. But this was, uh, I would say, mainly because the Institute of Public Health had said that it would not prevent spreading of the disease in any significant matter. And therefore, it, it was obviously uh, disproportionate. Um, we also, in addition to this point, pointed out that trust in a society is a very precious commodity, uh, we, and it's very important with trust in combating a pandemic. Uh, and so, comparatively speaking, I think that there is a very high level of trust in Norway, and enforcing a curfew would 
possibly have undermined this, this trust. So summing up, uh, I think we could say that in Norway, there was a lot of stumbling in the beginning and a lot of mistakes in different uh, areas, but it has gradually gotten better. Um, and I think it's also clear that in areas where there has been little central control, such as in, in municipalities or local government, uh, there has been more, um, uh, what should I say, uh, problems than at the central level. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and particularly in, on the local level, in municipalities, for example, there were much less discussions on, on human rights in connection with measures. So many times, of course, the measure itself could be defended, but the, the discussion was not there and the reasoning was not there. So that is sort of very short, um, my, uh, my contribution to this, uh, this seminar, which is a, a little bit about our report, but also a little bit about some other things that happened later. Thank you, Thank you so much, Paul. And we uh, have two questions already. So uh, the first one, thank you, Katarina, for a very interesting talk. I would be curious to hear how you think human rights might be at issue when governments impose an obligation to stay at a quarantine house for a certain period after entering a country. Recently, a court in Iceland ruled such an arrangement not sufficiently grounded in legislation, although the intent of that quick and recent le legislation seemed indeed to have been to provide a legal basis for this kind of enforced quarantine. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, so I think it definitely raises different human rights, such as the right to liberty and freedom of movement. Um, I think it's important to look at other countries' experiences. Australia was one of the first countries to do these quarantine hotels, and um, it was a bit of a failure, actually, the first time around. They basically employed... Um, people to be some sort of guards, but basically the guards started, uh, to put it nicely, mixing with the residents. <laughs> and this actually resulted in uh, COVID spreading from people in the hotels and um, out into the community. And I think in New Zealand also, which is basically COVID free, there was some question of whether COVID was spreading between the hotel rooms through the ventilation or something. So. In summary, I think it can definitely be um, an appropriate measure. I mean, especially now with the variants, I think that's changing a lot of countries' um, views on, on these uh, hotel quarantines. But in itself, it's not sufficient. I mean, it's, it's important that the conditions in the hotel are adequate and it's important that they are actually safe places. So they are actually designed to meet the aim of the restriction. Um, but I know in, in Norway, you are a, a fan of these um, hotels. So maybe, quote, you have some, some comments there. Um, we, we have uh, quarantine hotels as well. Yes, it was a severe criticism of the government uh, when it was sort of discovered or well, 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 people started to realize how many people who were actually entering Norway um, at, at any given time. And uh, that, of course, a lot of the, the spreading of the disease came through people who came from abroad in different, um, in different manners. And so the, the government has adopted a regulation saying that everybody who returns from unnecessary travel have to go to a quarantine hotel and and uh, be there for I think ten days and even pay for it themselves or at least pay for the food um, and um, this is supposed to uh, deter people from from going on on holidays abroad but we have a law which is not a new law which is uh, from the HIV. Uh, period, which is the law on preventing spreading of infectious disease. And in that law, there are very wide legal basis for, for doing quite, um, uh, um, quite rest or to, to enforcing quite restrictive measures on people. So we, we assume that uh, the, the quarantine requirements are probably within 
within that law, as you say, also because of the, the mutant uh, viruses and the potential for for more spreading. But um, yeah, it's certainly an issue. But of course, we have we do not have any kind of enforcement as such. People will get fined if they leave, but they cannot be held back by force. So that's uh, that's the uh, I think uh, significant uh, detail. Okay, thank you. And the next uh, question we have, uh, thanks for the wonderful presentations to both speakers. In light of the discussion on proportionality and Catalina's view on criminal sanctions, I wonder whether the speakers would like to reflect and comment on the recent judgment of the European Court of Human Rights in the case of Africa and others versus the Czech Republic. In this case, the Grand Chamber did not consider that imposing fines due to refusal to vaccinate children was disproportional. Do you consider that such reasoning on proportionality to be yet another spill of effect of COVID on international human rights treaty bodies? Do you want me to start? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's of course a very good question, and um, I think <clears throat> that uh, it was, of course, we had waited uh, quite a bit for that uh, uh, judgment. It it had been uh, long in the making, and um, but it does reflect, I would say, very clearly previous practice from the court in Strasbourg. Uh, they operate with this concept of social solidarity. Um, and the court has gone even further before there was another case where they accepted a person being vaccinated by force, actually, which in a case of diphtheria, I think, uh, in an area where, uh, where they found that this person wouldn't be medically harmed by such, uh, such a measure and that so therefore it was important that the society could protect itself from infectious disease. So I think uh, it, it was not surprising that they came up with this, uh, this weighing and saying that uh, these measures of vaccination is you know, within the margin of appreciation of, uh, of the European states. So. Yeah, I, I agree. It's it, it wasn't a it would have been I suppose a surprise if they had found otherwise. And you can say, especially in light of COVID and the ongoing discussions about the vaccine passports or whether people in certain professions can be forced to get a vaccine. So in, in that regard, yes, there must be some level of real politic there. But on the other hand, it is in line with the court's previous judgments. So I don't think it is a, um, a change in approach. No, I think the, the only thing one could say is that the vaccinations that the court has dealt with are vaccinations which have been tested out for many years, such as vaccinations against measles, which this, this case was about, for example. And in case of COVID, of course, uh, the vaccinations are new. And so that would be the only point where one could foresee some kind of distinction because the court has said that they would not force anyone to, to, to take a vaccine if it could harm their uh, health. Um, but uh, other than that, I think the judgment is pretty clear that, uh, yeah, the social solidarity outweighs uh, the person's right to, to privacy or to the uh, uh, freedom of religion for that matter. Okay. I think we have a last question here. Thank you, uh, Katharina, for your super interesting presentation. To what extent do you consider the com communication and information from the municipalities regarding recommendations on behavior to reduce COVID as playing a part in the focus on individual responsibility and the following stigmatization that we have seen during the pandemic? Thanks for your question. Um... Yeah, it's, it's a bit difficult to answer. I mean, I think the, like, the first thing that I really noticed was at the beginning of the pandemic, the recommendations were only in Danish. And I remember the uh, prime minister was asked, are you going to start providing information in other languages because not everyone in Denmark speaks Danish? And she said, you know, very, 
forthright, no, no, everyone should speak Danish. But it became pretty obvious pretty quickly that the pandemic doesn't really care what language you speak. Um, and it is part of the government, it's, it's necessary for the government to communicate with all groups in society. So that, that can turn on the other side, I suppose, that now the government does a lot in communicating in other languages. Um, and this can maybe shift the focus in a stigmatizing manner to um, certain um, people who speak certain languages. I think in terms of recommendations, another problem is that people are really seem to be really confused by them. Um, and this interplay between law and recommendations, which on the one hand, I uh, commend for not using the heavy hammer of the law. But of course, the question is that, I mean, I think because I work in this area, people are constantly asking me <laughs> what the recommendations are and, and everybody seems to have them wrong. So that's, I think that's a problem. Um, but in general, I, I mean, it's not that I don't think that there's any level of personal responsibility, which I never really thought I would hear myself say, but <laughs> I have reached that point um, of recognizing that, of course, the, the disease is transmitted um, through contact. So I do recognize that everyone has a role to play in the virus and in, in preventing the spread of the virus. But it is, it is a manner of how things are framed sometimes and also recognizing the the reasons behind, such as that not everyone works from home, not everyone can stay at home for 10 days if they're worried that they might um, have contracted COVID. Okay, and uh, this is probably going to be the, our last question from uh, Amy Clotworthy. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, Katerina. I'm currently working with a group of Nordic researchers to examine to examine Nordic exceptionalism through the concepts that may be seen as representative of the Norwegian, Danish, and Swedish national approaches, i.e. Dugnat, Samfund, Sin, and Folkvet, respectively. The article elucidates these three concepts through empirical case studies of prison populations and older people confined in long-term care facilities. My contribution or interest is specifically on the extended visiting ban to older people confined in long-term care facilities in Denmark. My question is, the visiting ban could be perceived as an unnecessary violation on the right to freedom of movement and the right to family and private life. Have you found this also to be the case in your research? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's an area I'm very passionate about. And um, we've written a paper on this, but in the context of Ireland, and we're also writing another one relating to the Nordic countries at the moment. Um, so I think it depends on a number of things. I mean, I think in Denmark, what has really been focused upon by organizations like the Alzheimer's Society is the, is the, um, the care facilities, the care homes going beyond what is actually permitted by the law. So on the one hand, at certain parts of the pandemic, um, you can say that the measures were protective um, and in some cases that could be proportionate. But what seems to have uh, happened, and there's a number of examples of this, is basically, for example, people, um, residents not being allowed to leave um, where they're living. And as Ko was uh, discussing in the context of Norway, there wasn't actually a provision allowing um, the use of force, so stopping people from actually leaving. Um, and another issue is even if they weren't stopped, it could be that they were forced to go into quarantine when they returned um, from, from leaving. So if they went for a walk with a family member, in some cases an institution uh, basically said they had to stay in their room for 10 days, which there wasn't a legal basis to. But in terms of it going on um, too long, I mean, the state does have a, a certain what's called margin of discretion. So it is, it is difficult um, in the abstract to determine whether it was a violation. So I think the things to maybe focus on, um, and I'd be happy to discuss more, is, is how it was applied in discrete cases. I can say as a final point, a general problem here is the lack of access to information. So I did a, a freedom of information request in November I'm trying to get access to complaints that have been made. A couple of weeks ago, I got, I finally got the, um, you know, the response and it was hundreds of pages. I was really excited. It's all redacted to the extent that 
essentially nothing is usable. And I think that's really problematic if researchers and you know, human rights institutions can't get access to the information to actually be able to evaluate and to help residents, for example, in bringing um, claims. So I think that's, that's something that needs to be looked at. I mean, because sometimes people, residents in these care homes are very vulnerable. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much to both speakers, to the audience for uh, giving us such a lively debate with so many interesting questions and two very interesting talks. This will be an excellent addition to the webinar series on COVID and uh, you will be able to find this um, webinar from today on uh, the NC Bio uh, YouTube channel if, uh, if you wanted to rewatch it or you want to share it with colleagues who didn't uh, have uh, the, the time in their schedules to be here today. So thank you so much to both of you. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Thank you. Bye.